What's up, everybody? This is Delvin. Before we start the podcast, I want to let you guys know that there's a little Easter egg at the end of this episode I'll add it in. It's so secret, I didn't even let BQ know about it. But it's a little Easter egg pertaining to something that was mentioned in this episode that I think you guys want to hear. So make sure you stay to the end of the episode to check it out. Thanks. Welcome to the experience. Welcome to the experience. Welcome to the experience. Welcome to the Delvin Cox experience. I'm your host, Delvin Cox, and with me today from the King of the Mountain podcast, we have BQ. Say what's up, brother, and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, man, what's good with you? Uh, BQ here from the King of the Mountain podcast. I've been hosting a podcast for a little over a year now. I cover uh, Impact Wrestling each week in a what I what I like to say in a very positive light, it's, it's not fanboy, you know, I'll, uh, if I don't like something, I'll say I don't like it, but I try to um, address it from an angle of, of someone who's excited about the product. There's a lot of people who podcast about WWE and act like it's just, you know, every single show is so amazing. You know, fans of TNA, Impact, Global Force have not really had that. If they don't have that podcast or it gets excited with them. So, you know, that's what I do with uh, King of the Mountain, and it's been uh, pretty successful. Definitely, definitely. One of my favorite podcasts out there right now. So as always with the podcast, I like to do the five for five. Five questions, five answers to break the ice. BQ, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. What was the best album you listened to in the past year? Best album I listened to in the past year? Um, I know this is going to be a, a funny album. Um, I mean, a funny answer. I, I do listen to hip-hop, but the... Uh, Best album, even though does it have to be new? No, it doesn't have to be new. Okay, <laughs> the the album I've been really excited about in the last year that I just discovered last week was Brooke Hogan's sophomore album, and I love it. I put she it on for the album. Album? Yeah, I, I, her first one wasn't that good, and I was driving to work the other day, and I just threw the sophomore al- album on. Um, I liked ninety percent of it, so oh, I've been playing that like nonstop. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta look out for that one. I didn't know she had a sophomore album. Yeah, I mean, it came out several years ago. But huh. I just, I don't know. I just randomly, huh, let's listen to Brooke Hogan today. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Second question. Favorite Let me give you, I'll, I'll give you a hip hop album just so I have some credibility. Okay. Um, MC8, Which Way is West, that came out uh, a week or two ago. Best hip hop oh. album this year. I didn't know that came out already. Huh. Gotta listen to some MC8. I like MC8. Phenomenal. Definitely. Okay, favorite all-time TV show? Favorite all-time TV show is Friends. I still binge watch it to this day. Huh, it's a good show. Dumbest thing you've ever done as a kid? Dumbest thing I ever did was, uh, I want to say I was um, probably in about seventh grade. I had, for some reason, I just got up in the middle of the night. It was probably about two in the morning and decided to run around my block naked. (laughs) <laughs> it wasn't a dare i wasn't drunk because i was a kid i just i don't know if it was a dream something just told me to wake up run around the block naked and come get back in bed that's a good one <laughs> <laughs> okay question four top five favorite wrestlers of all time oh my gosh this is this is a that's hard i haven't really thought about it um we do <laughs> <laughs> not, not my current guys um if i had if i had to be honest all time uh gosh they're probably all wwf guys probably uh macho man but not the macho man with the cowboy hat like once he got the cowboy hat i didn't like him no more uh, uh but macho man coco beware um jim dandle nightheart jerry lawler and uh, for a fifth, Jake the Snake. Oh, there's some really good choices. I had to and some surprising, <laughs> some surprising choices at that, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think usually when you think your favorite wrestlers, you think you're, you think from your childhood. So oh, Makes sense. Makes sense. The fifth question, the one I specifically picked out for you, your favorite bachelor or bachelorette? Oh, my gosh. What a great question. 
<laughs> so yes, I'm a huge fan of The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. Um, man, my favorite one, I think. Uh, gosh, that, that's a really hard one. I don't think I've ever been super engaged into the person who was <laughs> the bachelor, <laughs> bachelorette. I think they always like annoyed me to a certain degree. Uh, the current one, Rachel, Rachel Lindsay, who's the first uh, African American bachelorette. I like her a lot because she's she's been the most real in the process so far. Um, oh God, yeah, I'm gonna go with her. Okay, cool. <laughs> I never got into the Bachelor or Bachelorette. I always watched Flavor of Love. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I just uh, <laughs> years ago got into it. It just stuck with me. Yeah, a lot of people like that show. Now that we got the questions out of the way, let's start from the beginning. For those who don't know or haven't heard the story, what got you into liking pro wrestling? So it's funny. I, asked, I answered this question on my own podcast the other day. As a kid, everyone always says as a kid, but as a kid – what initially hooked me was Hulk Hogan's rocking wrestling, the cartoon. Yes. I love that cartoon. Yeah. So that's that cartoon because it's different now. If you, if you're looking for a TV, you just go a TV show. You just Google it. But you know, growing up as a kid, you never really understood when sh certain shows were on. Like sometimes you would catch them and then the next week they weren't on. And it's like the schedules are all over the place. So I very rarely was able to watch it. But anytime I did, it was, it was like the highlight of my day. And um, I think collecting a lot of toys as a kid, I don't know if you, I don't know how old you are, but we used to have thumb wrestlers. It I was, had those. Uh, okay. So it's like Junkyard Dog, Hulk Hogan, Iron Sheik, and Nikolai Volkov, Hillbilly Jim. Yeah. <laughs> and they were just little wrestlers. You just put them on your thumb and it was a figurine and they wrestled. So I think a lot of figurines and toys really got my, um, struck my fancy before actually watching the product. And do you remember the real big, hard plastic wrestling, hard rubber? I, I just was going to mention that to you. The big, hard rubber ones yeah. that didn't really move, but they were like bendable a little bit. Yeah. So I had that and I had, uh, um, I had Macho Man and Ricky Steamboat. Those are the only two I ever had. But I don't know, just the toys, the cartoons, that's what got me really hooked at a young age. And then I used to order – or I used to go to the um, local video shop and get all the Coliseum videos and VHSs and all that. Did you used to watch um, Saturday Night Main Event at the time? Because that's what got me into wrestling. Yeah, Saturday Night's Main Event as a kid was very special, you know, because that was only maybe a, a few times a year. It wasn't like a weekly thing. I think it was once a month, if I remember correctly. And I never knew that as a kid. Oh, gosh. To me, it was like four times a year. I don't, I don't even call it even being that much. But that was that was a lot of fun, and it was very special because WWF at a young age, I mean, not at my young age, but in their early years, I should say, where it was mainly enhancement talent, mat, you know, matches, swash matches. Yes. So when – Saturday night uh, main event came on, you knew, oh my God, I'm going to get some actual wrestlers versus wrestlers. And that was always a real big deal and very special. Who was your favorite at the time when you were watching wrestling as a kid? As a kid, like I said, uh, Macho Man prior to the cowboy hat. So Macho Man and then the Macho King, I really liked. Uh, you know, like I mentioned earlier, a couple other names, Coco Beware. I, I absolutely loved him. He never won, but I thought he he was a great sympathetic baby face. If you go back and list watch uh you know, say you have the network and you watch old WrestleManias, he got a louder pop than anyone that's on right now. You know, like back then, people just cheered with a different kind of passion. And uh he was still a popular wrestler despite always losing. And you were always cheering for him to win and it just never happened, but really enjoyed him. So those were the two when they came on. I was very excited. I like the Hart Foundation very much, uh, but Jim Neidhart was – everyone else was a Bret Hart guy. I was a Jim Neidhart guy. So those were the three cool. that really did it for me. That's definitely pretty cool. Just hear somebody else who appreciates the art of Jim Neidhart because he was very good and I think very underrated for the oh, yeah. time. So. so did you ever look at wrestling back then and even now, think that was something that you'd want to get involved in? Did you ever want to be a wrestler or even think that to this point that you would be doing – what you're doing right now with wrestling. As far as being a wrestler, I had the interest as a kid. I think a lot of people do, but you know, me being 37 right now, back when I was 
in my teenage years and everything. And you'll hear wrestlers talk about this on podcasts all the time. You, you got into the wrestling industry by luck. You didn't know where to train, how to train, nothing like that. So I don't, the opportunity never presented itself for me. I was always uh, very skinny as a kid. I was actually very skinny to an adult as an adult. I just started working out, lifting weights at a uh, age 34, you know, or th- 33. So I've been lifting weights for four years and I'm a, I'm a, you know, a little bigger now, but uh, prior to that, I was, I was pretty tiny. So I don't think my body could have, could have ever ha- handled it. Um, with podcasting, no, really, it, it wasn't until I decided to do the King of the Mountain podcast that it, it even really crossed my mind. I well, was, uh, I was doing music for a while as a hip hop artist and I had a podcast for music, but I got away from music and then got to wrestling. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's get to that. How did you, you were a hip hop artist? I was. And, and when I say this, I was not signed anywhere, or anything crazy by any means, but I, I did have a successful run. You could say, um, you know, I still pull in a little bit of money every month. It's nothing <laughs> crazy, but I mean, I still have uh, a little bit that comes in from iTunes and Google play and all that, but I've, people don't think I was ever an artist just by looking at me or uh <laughs> hearing me speak but yeah i was uh really into it i had done songs with crooked eye hopson skilo craig g uh the uh, group tangled thoughts that they're oh. broken up now but they're uh young deer demrick is uh popular from that group now he works a lot with exhibit uh be real um any hip-hop uh, heads the fab what's up any hip hop heads would die to hear these names: Craig G, Exhibit, Skilo. These are like legends. Yeah, I, I, uh, I was lucky. I, I def- there's a few that I never really got to work with, unfortunately, but uh, definitely, um, definitely a great experience. What was the album called? I want to get it. My, my last, my only two albums that are available online are uh, one's called Skill I Am, like Will I Am. <laughs> but, uh, the skill I am, and uh, the other one's called Another Debut. Neither of those albums feature any of my, you know, uh, high-profile uh, collaborations, just because the sound quality was not. I wasn't happy with the sound quality, and I never really got around to remixing them. But my song with Hobson is on iTunes and and Google Play and all that. Uh, it's called Popular, and. Uh, my artist name was BQ the MC. So BQ T H A E M C double E. I've got a couple videos on uh, YouTube as well. One is uh, so one. This was my like this. This is where I get a lot of my money every month. Uh, I was in the military, and I released the first ever song that featured a branch from all uh, an artist from all five branches of the military. So I re- I represented the Air Force. My cousin represented the Coast Guard. And then the uh, other three branches are not people I have good relationships with anymore, but we were on, they were on the song. I mean, it's, uh, it's in the upwards of 30,000 plays or something like that. Um, and then I did a, one video that I think it's at about maybe close to 15,000 right now. It was a tribute to the Sandy Hook victims, the kids that were uh, murdered several years back. And that was a collaboration with some organizations that were working with those uh working with those kids so those are my those are my two big ones along with the hobson song that uh have done really well what was your experience like in the air force man the military was i loved it i i joined it at a young age because i didn't really have much else going on for myself college was not working out for me i just didn't know what i wanted to do and it wasn't that I wasn't smart enough for college. It just wasn't, it just wasn't working. You know, uh, going back, I would have taken it more seriously. But as a kid, you're not always prepared for those challenges in life. So I joined the military, expected to, you know, do one, one uh, enlistment. Ended up uh, having a daughter. So in the military, they always says, you know, they always say having a kid changes things. You know, once you got a kid, you're you're in for life. And uh, I ended up doing 15 years. Loved it very much. Um, I was uh, stationed in California, which that's where I'm from. So they kept me home for the first six and a half years. And then to Florida and then to Illinois. And that's where I reside right now. 
I still live here, even though I got off uh, active duty. So I was a cop in the Air Force and uh, enjoyed it very much. Spent a few years as an instructor, uh, what's called a ground combat instructor. So for lack of better terms, training uh, troops for combat. So I did that for four and a half years and expected to do a full 20, but uh, and this is not a uh, political stab by any means, but um, you, usually when there's a, and I'm just speaking fact here, <laughs> usually when there's a Democrat in office, they make pretty major cuts to the military. Um, and that, you know, happened when Clinton was in office. And then, you know, it happened this time around Obama too, cut about 25,000 troops and I lost my career. Uh, I could have I came about four months short of qualifying for a 15 year retirement. So it was a a pretty frustrating thing that happened. I just kind of came to work one day and they said, Hey, everyone check your emails. A bunch of you are um, on this list of of possibly being discharged. So got that email and uh, nine months later I was, I was done. So I've spent the last three years trying to get back into the reserves because I wanted to at least have something to show for my career and the, you know, benefits and everything are not near what active duty is, but you know, I I miss the military very much. And it's been a three year process. I've been told no by every single person. And, uh, I finally got my yes. So, um, next month I'll be enlisting back in, uh, as a reservist and I'll be, uh, instead of doing the law enforcement, I'm going to be doing, uh, aircraft maintenance. Congratulations. That's awesome. That is really awesome, man. I think you touched on something I think is very interesting that a lot of people don't really know. And that's the fact that we served our country for 15 years and then you got let go. That's not a cool thing. Why Why is there this thing where we don't take better care of our people, our veterans, in a sense. I'll never be able to answer that question. Um, there's a lot of programs and groups and, and just people in general, nice people that, that do take very good care of veterans and the troops. So I, I never want to act like a victim by any means because the military took tremendous care of me. And um, I have very little complaints as far as that goes. And I never thought, being a veteran necessarily held me back in any point of life. But there's, you know, there's people like me that, I mean, gosh, I was so close and, uh, and it, it snap of the fingers and it was over and, yeah. you know, very frustrating because I have, I have a daughter that, uh, she's not necessarily special needs, but she does have some special considerations. I'll, I'll just put it like that. She's on a, quite a bit of medication. And now that's something that comes out of pocket because I cannot, uh, really afford to insure her, you know, the military took care of that for a long time. And now I'm paying a lot of medicine out of pocket and, you know, it's unfortunate things like that happen. It's uh, frustrating for me, but I kept going. I was like, I- I'm getting back in in one way, shape or form. And, you know, like I said, it's been a three year process. I've uh, failed medical physicals. I've gone through five or six different recruiters I've, <laughs> I've gotten every waiver possible I needed. I've hopped every single hurdle. And, uh, yesterday I was actually supposed to enlist back in and my recruiter calls me and says, I got, <laughs> they always say with me, if I don't, if I don't have bad luck, I don't have luck at all. So my recruiter contacted me right about an hour before I was supposed to swear in. She said, they randomly pulled your package for inspection. And you have to go back for another physical on Friday. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it was like crazy. literally, hey, let's grab one folder out of the stack, you know, uh, micromanage, look over it, redo some things. So so now I'm, relist- now I'm enlisting next month, but it's just uh, another part of the frustrating story. But, you know, I, I, I'm not quitting on this, so. <laughs> but as a veteran, do you think there could be things done better to prevent things like this forever. Like, for example, they let you go. Why is there not a system in place? Now, like I said, this is not a political podcast right now or anything like that, but why is there not a system in place to take care of you guys, to make sure you guys get jobs when you get back into the real world 
as a source. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I don't, as I said, I know that there are programs out there. I get emails all the time, like, oh, jobs for veterans and everything. But, you know, they, it always seems kind of shaky to me. I've always just went out and, and found my own employment. Everyone just has a different story. Uh, you know, with me doing the law enforcement thing, I got out of the military at, you know, age 34 or whatever. And agencies, you know, police agencies, corrections, they were not interested in a 34 year old rookie. And that's where I have really struggled personally since I got out. There's, there's some people that get in and they're doing, you know, top secret stuff. Those guys got out of the military and they're fine. You know, they walk right into a, you know, six figure job. So I think everyone's story is a little bit different, but, uh, you know, it's hard to say. I don't know if there's ever going to be a way to, to just take care of everybody because not everybody needs the help necessarily. So I, I, I don't have an answer for it. <laughs> I'm, I'm asking these questions because your story that you just told compelled me because of the fact that in the same situation you were in, he, oh. he, he, was, he was a Marine. Okay. And he served for, I want to say 13, 14 years, got out, couldn't find a job. He, he got lucky because he was fortunate enough to be able to be like, he applied to join the police force. And after a, a year or so, he finally got in. And that's what he does now. He's a police officer. But it, it fascinates me because you would think with all the experience you guys have in the military, it would almost be a shoe in the, for you guys to get in those type of positions. You know, I was I was un, unemployed for probably a good seven months after I got out. You know, fortunately, I had some money in the bank. I still had uh, other, a few other sources of income that were taking care of me. But and when I say I was unemployed, my first job ended up being a part time as a bouncer, um, and that was very humbling because I went from a point in the military where I was in charge for the most part to being at the bottom of a barrel at a nightclub, wow, that's... you know, so that was a uh, very humbling for me, but I, I won't say I didn't have that struggle. I, I, it took me quite a while to find employment, find good employment, I should say. And, you know, fortunately my last, I've been bouncing around jobs quite a bit because, uh, <laughs> you know, military guys, we move so much. We're not usually in the same place. So it's kind of been like that with civilian employment for me too. After a couple of years or a year, I'm like, I, I need something new. And fortunately my last three jobs have been, been uh, pretty good. And I actually had an interview today for a job that's even better paying than what I have now when they, they're, they're just hiring veterans. That's it. And uh, so sometimes, sometimes some of us get lucky. And I'm glad you seem like you're doing a lot better and you seem like you're doing great right now. So it's good to see that. Absolutely. Okay, let's get back into what we came to talk about. What got you into watching Impact and what got you into even more podcasting about Impact and Global Force Wrestling as it is now? All right, lo I love answering this question. So people would think that I am this historian of TNA and I'm not. Um, there's a lot of the early years that my listeners know way more about than I do. And I was just, because I was very casual with TNA growing up. Uh, you know, I was, I was kind of a WWE guy, to be honest. I, fast forward to now, I don't watch the product at all. I do keep up with results and things of that nature, but I don't sit down and watch it. So I'm strictly Global Force Wrestling now. But, but for years, I was very casual. So there were a lot of happenings within a company. When they say, you know, wrestlers were getting paid late and Jeff Jarrett this and Dixie Carter this, I was completely oblivious to that because because I was so heavily involved in my my music and you know creating music and building a fan base and things like that I, w I didn't have time for the dirt sheets and all that so i never understood i never knew of all the negativity that surrounded the company and you know like i said i watched it very casually and then when they went to destination america i, I didn't watch it at all because i didn't have the channel and i didn't even know you could stream wrestling online i had no clue so there was that year where I had no clue what happened. Didn't watch the product whatsoever. Uh, kept up with some of the results a little bit, but didn't really understand it. Uh, and then I, uh, I ordered Bound for Glory 2015, if I'm not mistaken. 
this is the one that had a main event, a triple threat of Galloway, EC3, and Matt Hardy. Uh, I think it had a Bobby Roode versus Lashley. Pretty good card. So I sat down and watched the card. And again, I'm completely oblivious to dirt sheets at this time. And I watched the pay-per-view, and, and I loved it. I was absolutely engaged in it. I enjoyed every match. And a couple days later, I, I get on the internet and say, hey, I'm going to check out some reviews here about Bound for Glory. And pulled them up, and some dirt sheets and podcasters acted like it was the worst show they had ever seen. And I think that's when it became very obvious to me that there was a a bias against the company because I was watching the fan. I was watching as a level level playing field fan. I didn't, you know, wrestling was wrestling to me at the time. And I enjoyed that pay-per-view more than I had enjoyed a WWE one in quite some time. And uh, that's when I really fell in love with the company. And I said, this is the company I want to follow. And uh, when they debuted on Pop, I just I jumped in head first. And after a few months of seeing a lot of negativity online, I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna try this podcasting thing. I from from making music. See what when you're a music artist, especially a hip hop artist, maybe years ago in the MySpace days, you could upload a song, and a stranger would listen to it, and you could make a fan. But right now, music is so oversaturated that I knew I had to learn how to market myself and how to stand out. And that's why, you know, when I brought up earlier, I've got two songs that, you know, have been my big ones, my military one and my dedication to Sandy Hook, because I understand, I understood I needed to make music that no one else was doing. And I learned how to be an individual. I learned how to be different from other people. And I learned how to market myself both online and through my music and I transferred all that knowledge over to podcasting. So I knew when I started my podcast, you know, it might be slow for a couple of weeks, but I, I was confident in myself that I knew how to build an audience because I did it through music and sure, sure enough, I was able to do so. But as I said earlier, I wanted to be a podcast that the fans of the company could be excited about and say, Hey, I listen to this podcast and I'm blocking out all the other negativity it, it, we're just enjoying it for what it is. And um, it's been really, really successful so far. And I've had a lot of growth over the last uh, week, actually. <laughs> but over the last <laughs> month, quite a bit of growth. But the last week, week and a half of it has been uh, probably my hottest period yet. Cool. So what are some of the challenges you face with developing a podcast? I think there's always the... Well, first of all, thinking back at my initial podcast doing it on Google Hangouts and just uploading and seeing what happened. And, you know, we weren't working with good quality. We weren't working with good webcams, super ghetto. So the fact that we even had an audience period, um, I really appreciate. But over time I have learned, okay, quality is what really matters to a lot of people. So I wanted to put on a good audio quality podcast and, uh, I wanted to look the part, sound the part. And there's a lot you just learn along the way. And um, I think building an audience is always, always difficult. I still face challenges with it just because I do a majority of my media, my social media on Twitter and the global force following on Twitter is not strong. So uh, I, th I think it's a little stronger on Instagram, but I don't have Instagram. So it's been a little uh, challenging. Okay, where am I going to find this audience at? I got to find out where they're hanging out at. They're not necessarily on Twitter. What can I do to find them? So I've done a lot of creative things to build that audience. And But I think as a podcaster for anyone, the audience is always the hardest part. Learning how to project your voice properly. And that's still something I work on consistently. How can I stop saying um so much or uh? Because I say those words a lot. And even as a as an instructor in the military or as a public speaker, I thought I cut all those things out, but apparently I still do it. So <laughs> still working on that. But I think as a podcaster, it's you're growing every single time. You're trying to get better every time. I think my last two shows have been my best ever. 
And that's what I'm trying to do every single week. So getting into that, how hard is it keeping your brand consistent and fresh? Um, it's actually not too hard for me. Uh, only because I understand how to market the part podcast. So I have a lot of extra content I've been uploading to the YouTube channel and, and it's actually exploded the channel in the last week and a half. I've, you know, added 120 subscribers in just the last, in the last week. And, uh, one of my vlogs have already surpassed 5,000 views. Um, you know, the others are at a few hundred or some are coming close to a thousand and everything, but I've always understood I can't just build off a pod, a weekly podcast. I knew that I had to upload additional content because in marketing, my podcast is my home run. That's what I eventually want people to get to, but I have to hit some singles first. So that's why I put up these vlogs. Some of them are, are singles, some are doubles, some are triples. And then I'm hoping eventually one will be that home run as, as one of them, you know, my one where I kind of broke the news about Taya and Mundo doing the uh, live events. That's the one that's exceeded 5,000. And that's, that's been my home run. But, you know, every time I upload content and, you know, I'm like, okay, this one's, this one's a single. Cause you got to have a balance single, double, triple. And I just always understood how to keep content fresh. I haven't done it a whole lot in the year leading up to this because I just had other priorities as a parent or as a student or for my job, but it's, it's not a concept that's difficult to me. I know how to, I mean, today I just did a uploaded a discussion question and that was something different for my channel. I mean, I have about four or five different segments on my channel and it's just, it's not something that's really difficult for my brain. Cause I've studied this for so long. I was just going to get in there. You already brought it up since you brought it up. You took a couple months hiatus for personal reasons. Then you came back with a whole new format for the show, which I love, by the way. Thank you. What, what brought on the change to, you used to be like, a, I want to say a three person podcast, if I'm correct. Yeah, we were a three person show. And, uh, you know, first it was myself and my co-host Will, and we were rocking with each other for quite some time. And, uh, you know, top of the year, he, uh, you know, we were, we were doing podcasts and, you know, myself and our other co-host Kyle, you know, we would text and be like, okay, we're getting online here in a couple of minutes. And, and Will was not showing up for whatever reason. And, uh, you know, so Kyle and I just started pressing forward together. And then I had to take the hiatus because I was, I was residing in Florida. You know, I decided to relocate my family back to Illinois and that was a that was a big process because I had to live with the in laws for a few months until we you know we, we were able to purchase a house. And I just knew I couldn't really consistent consistently drop a podcast, so I just I took the time off. And in that time off, you know, Kyle, the other co co host, said, "Hey, I would like to do my own thing." See, with Kyle, he had he had a different vision of what he wanted to podcast covering impact to be it was a very different than my vision and he was always really good with ideas of like we should try this we should do this but it, it didn't fit my vision of a show so he he said you know respectfully i'd like to break off and do my own thing so he does a impact heads radio podcast and it's a lot more humor based and high energy i would say mine's more of a, a radio uh talk uh sports radio type of type of show and in real life, I'm actually quite a goofy person, but I don't really desire to be funny on my podcast. It's just not, it's not what I want to deliver. I think people want to hear an analysis of the show and you know, that's just what I do. But when I came back, I had done one podcast that the list, when I came back, the first podcast of listenership was absolutely terrible uh, compared to my previous numbers. And I said, okay, this is the time for me to buckle down use this marketing brain of mine and, and make this thing blow up. And, you know, now I bring in a guest host every week to add something fresh to the show. And, uh, my first co-host will, he, he actually did talk to him the other day. He wants to come back on, but he's hasn't been watching the product. So I said, you know, you need, you need to catch up because this global <laughs> force thing is not the TNA thing that, it, you know, you remember. So, uh, 
you know, that's how I keep it fresh. New, new go co-hosts every week. And, um, my marketing mind is just moving constantly and, uh, you know, good things are happening. And I was going to bring that up. I'm glad you brought it up. When you took your hiatus, it was TNA. You come back. It's global force. How did you adjust to that change with, in terms of your podcast and everything like that? Because things kind of seem like they happen so fast with Dixie Carter leaving and global force taking over and Jeff Jerry coming back into the fold. It's just so much stuff happened. And then the Hardys leaving. Just how did you adjust to that? Uh, it was a challenge, but it was an exciting challenge for me because as the, as I knew as a marketer, with the company changing and rebranding that a whole new set of rules were going to come into play on social media. I knew that I had an opportunity to rank my videos on YouTube for global force wrestling, where ranking against TNA or impact wrestling was very difficult. Now we're, you know, a new, it's a new company starting from the ground up, so to speak. And I knew that I could compete in that field because instead of, trying to be one of the people covering impact wrestling or TNA wrestling. I changed the mindset. I'm going to be the guy covering glo global force wrestling. So I just, I've, I've, I've rolled with the punches as the company has, has evolved. And I looked at it as a very exciting challenge. And I just feel like it's wide open for me now to, to, you know, burst on the scene. And it, like I said, I can rank for new keywords now. And it's exciting. Um, this is probably the most fun I've ever had with the show. And yes, there was, I was a little concerned at first, but with all the positives, maybe even some of the negatives that were in the news, I knew that people were online looking for global force wrestling stuff. And those are the people I've been targeting. It was difficult. It was difficult when Dixie was running the show because she was just doing impact wrestling one day a week and there was no digital content. There was no positive news throughout the week. The website wasn't getting updated. There were no, no photo shoots with the knockouts. The wrestlers weren't being interviewed on podcasts. There, it was just one. It was just a show one day a week, and that became very difficult to market my podcast because when all you're doing is delivering a wrestling show one day a week, Thursday is the only day people are online talking about. Impact Wrestling. No one was doing it five days a week, seven days a week, and now, because the explode the um, digital content with the Global Force channel has exploded, and lots of good things are coming in, new wrestlers are coming in. There's people online looking for updates and looking for podcasts, and those are the people I've been able to to reach out and grab. Good, good. So now, with the whole anthem thing which is kind of great and it's kind of controversial because Anthem kind of gets looked at as the bad guy in a sense where the first thing that happened when they, when they got there was Matt and Jeff Hardy leaves. Then you see all these departures. In the retrospective, it looks like, oh, maybe, maybe they did the right thing. But how did it feel to see these departures? And even now we still have departures being uh, kind of in that inner circle in a sense where King of the Mountain Podcast is your baby. Right. And now they're making these changes that are drastic. Like El Patron being brought in there. And then all of a sudden you hear these problems with El Patron and then he's getting suspended. It's just so much stuff happening with Impact. And a lot of it's positive, but a lot of it's negative. How do you deal with those type of things? Well, as far as the wrestling, the, the wrestler departures go, I've seen the bigger picture in every sense. People, people see on paper, okay, Matt Hardy leaves. Uh, and, you know, I'm not going to lie. At the time, I really didn't want the Hardys to leave because I didn't want the broken, broken gimmick to go with them. I was going to, you know, at the time I was like, God, I'll be devastated if that shows up on WWE TV. Now I, could, I couldn't care less if it does because – the way that they overexpose their talent um, and, and, and the fact that they put everybody on every show, I know that the gimmick will, will burn out. So I'm not, 
super concerned with it now, but I've always understood the bigger picture with the departures. And, you know, a guy like Galloway most likely was walking all over Dixie Carter. And there was a lot of wrestlers, who, especially the Hardys, especially Matt, who are walking all over Dixie Carter. And that's why some of them left and they're so pissed off. Oh, you know, they're doing bad business. No, Anthem is not going to let you walk all over them. They're they're not Dixie Carter. You're not going to come in and tell me what you're going to do and what you're going to make. Um, so I think Anthem is actually not the bad guy that people are portraying them to be. I think they're actually very good businessmen, and they're they're making moves, saying, "Okay, we're gonna we're not even going to try to resign some of these guys who we think already have one foot out the door because they're making a lot of money." We can we can turn those contracts into people who really want to be here and are hungry to make a name for themselves. So with departures, I don't think I think Jade hurt a little bit, and uh, Davy Richards with his retirement thing kind of hurt. Uh, Christina Von Erie on a, on a lesser extent kind of hurt too. I, I hope that she is uh, brought back. I don't really know what's going on with that. Because the company is always very hush hush when they release guys. It's not like WWE he re- releases a press press statement. You know, the Global Force never says anything, so you never really know. Um, regarding the negative press, it is very frustrating. It seems like Melter has really really good timing. When when really things good things are going on, he'll come up with something. And you know, his hot one right now, where he's got the wrestling world thinking that the company taking 10% of the booking fees and hundred percent of their merchandise fees is this horrible thing, but he's not reporting that, you know, the company is acting as the booking agent. A lot of wrestlers have agents who handle all their bookings and, you know, just like in a sports world in the NBA or something, agents receive a cut. 10% is, I mean, say a booking fee is $400, you know, 10% is 40 bucks. Like it's not that big of a deal. You know, they could be taking a lot more than that. I guarantee the wrestlers that WWE puts out in, in the uh, public eye with public appearances, I guarantee you WWE takes a lot more than 10% from that. When John Cena goes on Good Morning America, they're not taking no 10% from what he gets paid. So I think, you know, some of the negativity drives me crazy because it's not true or it's not, it's just not 100% of the information. As I said, it's a booking fee. The, they're not also they're also not covering the fact that the company is also covering the travel expenses and hotel expenses for these wrestlers so that the independent promotions don't have to i would imagine that works as a tax write off for the company at the end of the year and it's very beneficial for them that might be an area where it does hurt the wrestler cuz they can't write it off themselves and then with the merchandise yeah they do keep 100% but they fail to report that there's a lump sum payment that the wrestler receives first, you know, instead of going through the process of, of uh, royalties and getting into late payments, and all that stuff again, you know, they're, they're doing stuff a lot smarter this time. So I always take it with a grain of salt because I really trust Jared. I really trust Anthem and I trust that they are doing good business. It's just the way the narrative is being flipped online. Uh, you know, there's very little negativity that I really believe, to be honest. Cool. So, you're very good at promoting not only Global Force, but yourself. How did you get so good at that? And not only that, how did you get so good at shutting down trolls? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, as far as promotion and everything, it's kind of like I mentioned earlier. I was doing the music thing. And I did music for 15 years, so from age 15 to um, 30. Oh, gosh, I did it more than that. So I stopped at about 32. So I did it for quite some time, about 17 years. Wow. Of course, in my younger years, I was just learning. But then I got to the point I was, I was cutting albums and everything. And year by year, the music industry and the, the hip-hop scene got so flooded with people Cause face it, if someone to come come up to you right now and be like, "Hey, check out my song," you're like, "Dude, get away from me!" <laughs> and that's what that's what hip hop has become, unfortunately. So, as I was saying, I had to learn how to cut through the clutter. I would spend hours of my spare time on the internet reading about. I mean, learning how to market myself. I would go on Amazon and order 
five, six marketing books and, and, and branding books and just sit there and read them. And once I learned all that information, it's, it's, it's easy for me now to take something and cut through the clutter. It's, it's not even a challenge, uh, you know, not even a little bit, but I spent a lot of time learning how to do it though. And, uh, it's something I just understand very well. So I, you know, just from the music industry, from, from how can I stand out as, as a rapper, as an MC, I just took it to the podcasting world and I cut through all the clutter, uh, regarding the trolls. I don't know. You know, like I said, I'm a pretty funny, witty guy in real life. That's just not the way I deliver my podcast. Uh, so some of the stuff just comes natural, but usually my plan is to retweet something a troll says, uh, kind of destroy them. And I know that I have a very engaged following and a lot of people respond. And my goal is for, to get that person to take the tweet down. So that's, you know, I'm not really trying to necessarily embarrass someone or anything. My goal is to get the tweets down. So I retweet, destroy them, have my following uh, respond to them. And, you know, sometimes I take it down, sometimes they don't. But I do it for the good of the company, to be honest. So how hard is it going out there, waving the TNA flag, impact flag, no, no, not TNA, don't let's not even wear that sad flag. <laughs> <laughs> How hard is it wearing, waving the impact flag and showing your support out there? And when people, you got people out there that's always touting WWE and kind of trying to make it a competition and saying things that are really not factual. It is frustrating. I wear, you know, you, you're looking at me right now on the webcam. I have my Alley t shirt on. I have uh, wrestling shirts every single day of the week. My wife would probably prefer that I dress a little nicer, but I have some kind of Global Force shirt on every single day of the week. I, I order everything they put out. I go on pro wrestling tees. I order a lot. So it's the company's become my life, so to speak, as far as hobbies go. Um, it is hard, though. You know, last year I was wearing an EC3 shirt. I went to a theme park. Not, we have Knott's Berry Farm out in California where I'm from. It's... It's a comp competitor of Disneyland out there, but it's a, uh, it's a theme park based around peanuts. Uh, you know, Charlie Brown, Snoopy, all that. I love not very far. I've been there before. Oh, yeah. Okay, it. cool. I love yeah. It. So I was wearing an EC3 shirt and I did have people like, hell yeah, TNA, EC3, you know, but then I, w I did r walk past a couple of people like, oh man, what the hell is that? And now they weren't acting like some big badass guy like they do on the internet. You know, they they would do it jokingly and whatever but it it is frustrating that i can't just wear my shirts and without someone judging me because of it or you know on my facebook page my personal page i used to share a lot of stuff from the company and i would have people who are wwe fans oh what the fuck is that uh they don't even have any good wrestlers and then you get in that conversation when did you last watch it oh i haven't watched it in like four years okay then you know why are we having this conversation? I got tired of the conversations. So now I just keep my Facebook page pretty clean as far as that goes. But <laughs> there are there are a lot of frustrations with just trying to enjoy the company and other people not letting you do it or trying to not let you do it. Uh, I just deal with it. But why does Impact and Global Force get that kind of hate? Because WWE... I, I watch all wrestling. I watch WWE. I watch Impact. I watch NXT. I watch Russell Circus. I watch basically all of them. Why does Impact get this such visceral hate and lack of knowledge in terms of, let, let's say, for example, for example, people always talk about the Divas Revolution and all that thing, which is great. Don't get me wrong. But Impact was doing this already. Yeah, they, they've been doing it. And I got into an argument on Twitter just the other day, like, no, the women's revolution started with Charlotte and Becky. And I'm like, no, it started for that company. And uh, right. In all honesty, I, I don't really see how it West wrestling, you know, again, I'm not watching actively, but I don't see how women's wrestling has really evolved in that company because all I'm seeing promoted are a bunch of multi-women matches uh, the same people fighting each other, the title being hot swapped, 
and I'm only seeing the same four talented girls. I, I don't, the other ones they are bringing up to the roster might be good promos or whatever, but they're not, no one's been on the level of those four girls that they've been bringing in with the exception of Asuka. So I, I don't really see that revolution they're talking about. I don't think the knockouts are at its highest peak at this moment by any stretch. I, I do think you probably see better women's wrestling on WWE at the moment, but they have been doing it for years and they, they don't get the respect. And there's a lot of double standards that unfortunately the company deals with, you know, uh, Oh, only 350,000 people watch. Well, a hundred thousand people watched ring of honor last week. So where, where's the hate there? Um, the difference is, if I'm being unbiased, is that at one point, you know, TNA went out of their way to become competitors of WWE and frankly became their enemy as well. They didn't just carve their own lane like Ring of Honor does right now where they just do their thing. Lucha Underground, you know, just kind of does their thing. TNA was bringing in the former wrestlers. Uh, they were bashing the company on air. They tried to start up the Monday Night Wars. And, you know, when it happened with WCW, it was a little more organic. You know, they try to, they try to, they try to do things to create a buzz. And I, I can, ex I can respect that. And I think that's why that stuff doesn't really bother, bother me to this day, because I know why they did it, but because they did it, they created a lot of enemies. And I think there's still a lot of people, obviously in WWE that hold that grudge still. And the fans tend to hold that grudge as well, even though it was something that happened a long time ago with people who aren't even in the company anymore. But there's there's a there's a double standard out there. Some of it is probably the company's fault. A lot of it, I don't believe, is. But not recognizing the knockouts for you know Gail Kim and Taryn Terrell and Brooke and Kong for what they did is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, definitely. So how hard is it? Or difficult, shall I say, it is to watch wrestlers that was in TNA and Impact Wrestling go to WWE and make names for themselves. When I say that, I mean not necessarily like Bobby Roode, anybody like I'm talking about guys like AJ Styles, who was Mr. TNA, and now he's at WWE killing it. And people are like, where is he? This guy been all this time. Well, he's been at he was in TNA for forever, and nobody watched it. I'll be transparent. It, it does bother me. It does hurt me a little bit. And I do get jealous um, a little bit. I don't know if as a podcaster, I'm allowed to get jealous of a wrestling company, but I do. I think it's for us people who really love the company and watch these guys for years. I think it is, it is very hurtful to discount what they did. And you know, it doesn't matter if it was probably Kurt Angle didn't receive much troll hate, but you know, Jeff Hardy, Matt Hardy, Galloway, uh, all these guys were washed up once upon a time. That's all uh, washed up WWE rejects. And all of a sudden these guys show up in another company and all that goes out the window. And I, that, that does bother me quite a bit because it shows if people would just watch the damn show instead of filling their their mind with this hatred and negativity they'd probably enjoy it i have people in my family and friends who are casual wrestling fans or, or not wrestling fans at all and i've had them watch impact and they've liked it better than wwe you know it doesn't have the lights and sirens and the bells and whistles and the bright lights but if you're just sitting there as a wrestling fan watching the product I really think it's a better show. And um, it is hurtful. It's hurt because I think I saw a graphic the other day where they were hyping up, you know, Bobby Roode against Drew Galloway, possibly being his next opponent. People are like, oh my God, that's going to be so good. Those motherfuckers fought in TNA and you didn't give a yeah. shit. Um, yeah. So it is frustrating. It, it, is, uh, it is hurtful as a fan to see that stuff. It's it's hurt, you know, the, the big pop that Kurt Angle got. You know, I see that Kurt Angle Kurt Angle tweets now and has, you know, a thousand retweets and stuff. When he was a TNA, people weren't retweeting his stuff. Um, 
you see people like Matt Seidel has 600,000 followers, but because he's not a part of WWE, he tweets and gets a couple hundred likes. The Singh brothers who have 30,000 followers tweet something and people are all over it. And there's a thousand retweets and some ridiculous amount of likes. That stuff bothers the, the fanboy stuff bothers me a lot. I think when you're a fanatic of anything, it's very unhealthy for wrestling, but I, I just, it hurts me. I'm bringing up the Singh brothers versus Seidel thing because I just, it just hurts not seeing a level playing field out there for professional wrestling. True, true, true. So, how do you think Global Force can get impact where it needs to be at? Um, it's going to take a little while to bring the people back, so to speak. They've been they have to do you know i used the example earlier of my podcast where someday i'm hitting a single someday i'm hitting a double someday i'm kind of swinging for the fences hoping to hit a triple and that's what you do in good marketing another example is like boxing you don't just go out there and go for the knockout you you have to land several jabs before you can land that that right hook and that's how the company has to look at it too. We have to have a balance of guys come off the indies that no one's really familiar with, you know, Marche Rocket, Caleb Conley, guys like that. You have to have that balance, but then you also have to have the you have to start attracting some indie darlings. You know, Ring of Honor's taking them all or NXT. Yeah. You know, you have to start becoming a realistic home for that. And I think with the Chris brothers and um uh, uh, Sammy Guevara and, and now we're bringing ACH in that's good because the, the, now you're starting to get into that indie darling uh, uh, stratosphere a little bit so you want to build stars you want to bring in some established ones and then you you do want to bring in some of these former WWE guys if you can do something with them you know Brandy Rhodes we brought her in for a name she didn't she was no she did nothing for the company you know, and thank God they um, rectified that mistake and they, they released her or chose not to resign her. I, I don't know what the, but she's not with the company anymore. But there have to be some singles, some doubles, and some triples. And, uh, you know, if you're able to land that Rey Mysterio, who's going to draw, if you're able to land that John Hennigan and that Taya, then then great. You know, that's, that's really going to help the company quite a bit. I think the focus on the X Division is going to help a lot because I had said on my podcast, guys, the X division's never coming back. The X division's dead. WWE has, has, you know, they had the cruiserweight thing going on at the time. I was like, they, they've become the hub for this shit. And he, and NXT too. And ring of honor. I was like, these cruiserweights and lightweights got way better options than wrestling in this slow ass X division we got going on. And, um, you know, we had people, Global Force had people in the X Division who aren't even X Division wrestlers just because they needed to fill the slots. Now we have the focus on the X Division and the Cruiserweight uh, 205 Live thing has, has been so poorly received. Um, and I don't think Lucha Underground is going to be a lot around a lot longer, my personal opinion. Um, and people are starting to split from Ring of Honor to go to NXT. So this is their time to establish this X division to become what it once was. It might not be as crazy, but it can be the hub for cruiserweight wrestling. I think they have a good opportunity. Um, they, they have a lot of departing knockouts. This is the time to reestablish that knockouts division because as I said earlier, you turn on Raw or SmackDown, it's just the same five or six women doing multi-matches all the time or elimination matches or six-man tag matches. They can be the spot for women's wrestling again i really i really think so and tag team wrestling i mean absolutely that what, what wwe's doing with tag team wrestling right now is they don't really have anyone worth turning on the tv for in my opinion but you go to you watch impact and you've got gars and laredo kid you've got lax you're gonna have the chris brothers coming in um even to a lesser extent veterans of war but we have some really talented tag teams right now and i think they can be the hub for tag team wrestling as as well i think the world title scene is always going to be their their weak point 
But I think that if they focus on the X division, women's division and tag division, the way they need to, I, I, and, and, and hit a couple doubles that turn into triples, a couple triples that turn into home runs. I, I think a year from now, it's going to be a completely different ball game. And this, what Jared is doing right now, partnering with companies, I guess because of blind hate, people are, are, are failing to see how genius that truly is. And I think he's okay with that, with being an underdog with his vision. Cause I, I really think a year from now, it's going to be a completely different ball game. And, um, you know, I know I've given these long winded answers, but Great I think, that, I, you know, I think they have to start being a better hub for casual fans because the casual fans of wrestling don't know about Dixie Carter. They don't know about Jeff Jarrett selling gold bars. They don't know about the late pay. They don't know the drama. So if they can start getting in front of these casual viewers a little bit more, you know, they're going to start uh, making new fans and, and a good comparison. So I'm a, I don't remember. Are you an NBA fan? Yes, I am. Okay. Miami so, Heat fan. Who? Miami Heat. Oh, God. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You're going to roll my, you're going to roll your eyes right now. I'm a Los Angeles Clippers fan. So I've been a Clippers oh, fan. Oh, sorry. Since. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been a Clippers fan since I was a little kid. And when I was, when I was younger, we literally had, it was like the TNA of basketball. We had, um, games where only 4,000 people were in the crowd. And Ooh. by NBA standards, if you've got 12,000 people in the crowd, you have an empty arena. And, you know, the Clippers were playing in front of 4,000 people while the Lakers were selling out and winning championships. And we were never able to compete. And in some, in some ways we still cannot, but because the company has, I mean, the team has been so good for the last uh, I say so good, you know, second round of the playoffs, but we haven't been a laughing stock. We've That's been good. so we've been good for the last, you know, six years or so, and the Lakers have been so bad. A lot of kids are growing up and they know nothing about the Lakers championships. They know nothing about the Lakers being good. They just see, damn, these Clippers are killing it. And now the Clippers are playing in front of sold out arenas. Um, so sometimes it's a it's a matter of time. Some of these Kids right now that are 18 and don't really know much about the global force history, the TNA history, if they just continue on the uphill, when they start turning 23, 24, 25, they're going to, you know, become hardcore core fans. So it's a, it's just a matter of, you know, every, it's, it's going to be a transition um, as people grow older and everything. So I just think it's the right time to, to address that younger audience and the casual audience. Two more questions for you. One. What do you think King of the Mountain Podcast and Global Force Wrestling will be at in 10 years from now? 10 years. I, I can't say I'll be doing the podcast at 47 years old. I, I don't see myself doing that. But I can tell you uh, a year from now. I can, well, I'll say by the end of the year because I'm someone I operate off goals. I have a daily goal of YouTube subscribers. Okay, I'm, I'm going to get... My, I'll be honest. My daily goal is 10. Um, I'm doing about 15 or 16 a day though, but my daily goal is to always grow by 10. Um, so I know, I already know by this weekend, I'll, ha I'll hit number 500. And I already know by the end of the year, I will hit a thousand. I don't, I don't have to say, I hope I get to a thousand. Like I'm, I will get there. I, I know for a fact, because I just know, <laughs> I know what my daily numbers are. I know how, to push that. I know what my goals are. So by the end of the year, you know, I expect to have that thousand subscribers and I um, expect to be a, a podcast that helps other podcasts out too. Cause you'd be surprised the number of people hit me up looking for that silver bullet, that magic bullet of how do I, how do I become like you? And um, it's flattering, but I also let them know, well, this is years of, of studying how to market myself. This isn't just something that I can't give you just one magic bullet and you're going to have all this going for you all of a sudden. But I do want to be a podcast that's not selfish and, and tries to help others out. And I'm going to start doing that here pretty soon. So uh, I really see really big things for myself with the show by the end of the year. And I hope to have some kind of a loose partnership with the company that's um, 
you know, what, however I can help them, whatever capacity I've helped, uh, Ali with her YouTube channel a little bit. So I've built some connections. So we'll see, you know, that's maybe it's a pipe dream to get involved with them, but I really think with my marketing mindset, I can help them. Um, as far as global force, I, I really expect the company to keep going and going. Uh, I think the only way it dies is if Anthem decides one day, uh, we're just, we're, we're pulling out. We're just, um, you know, they just decide we don't want to put money into this anymore or something like that. I mean, it's like the Houston Rockets right now out of the blue, they're getting sold. The, the owner just decided I'm, I'm done and he's selling the company, you know? So I don't know if Anthem pulls out one day, it might, it might be a bad thing, but I don't, I, I do think the company is going to continue to be here another 10 years. Final question. What advice do you have for people who want to do a podcast, whether it's a wrestling podcast or something like this? What advice do you have for those type of people? I would say know what your niche is, know what your audience is. Um, you know, that you podcasters out there who think, oh man, if I do a podcast that covers WWE, Global Force Wrestling, ROH, and Lucha Underground in one show, then everybody's going to listen. That you're you're doing yourself a, dis, a disservice. You want you know if I'm using a uh, a, an al a basketball analogy again right now, specialists are what are popular: the three point specialist, the shot blocking specialist, defensive specialist. Right now, you don't have to be a well rounded all around player like maybe ten fifteen years ago. Now they like people who have one skill set. And you stand out because of that one skill set. So know what your target audience is. Know what's going to make you different from other podcasters. If you go out there and try to do what everybody else is doing, I assure you it will not work. It, it just won't. I really think people need to learn how to market themselves. Marketing does not mean promote your shit all over the place. Marketing is, is learning how to get people to take certain action you know, sometimes people will question one of my Twitter statuses like, oh, why are you even talking about that? I know what I'm doing. I know that I'm, I want to get a certain reaction out of people. I know I want to get certain engagement from people. I know I just, I'm doing something because I know a lot of people are going to like it or retweet it. And I want to, I want to be seen like there's always a rhyme and reason for every time I hit that tweet button uh, from a marketing standpoint. And if someone's really serious, you know, I, there's a few books I really like that you know, I can recommend, but I really learned it through literature. Uh, you know, when, when, when I was doing music, I always told people I learned how to be a marketer, not a music marketer, but a marketer. And then I, I transferred that to music. Now I'm transferring that knowledge to podcasting. So, you know, learn to market yourself, learn how to I mean, come up with your niche target audience that you know exactly who you're talking to. And come up with different, different ways to be different than everybody else. You know, you just, you just gotta be creative. If you do a podcast one day a week and expect your audience to grow, it's probably going to do so at a fairly slow pace, but what can you do? That's just different than everybody else. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot I could get into. I could do a whole show <laughs> on it, but you know, those, those are the things that I, I think are really important. We definitely going to have you back on to do that. Yeah. I have a conversation about, marketing and everything that goes into it, man. Definitely. Thank you for coming on, BQ, man. Anything else you want to say? Prom promote the podcast. Let them know about all the great guests you're going to have coming up on the show. So, so the King of the Mountain podcast, I have I have a website. It's not the most beautiful website in the world, but it's uh, kotmpodcast.site. That's dot S-I-T-E. Um, that podcast, you can, uh, I update it every, the website every Sunday, and you can see the podcast in, Podbean form in YouTube form in SoundCloud form. I only have like a couple people that use SoundCloud, but they like <laughs> it. So I, I still provide it for them. But if you go to KOT and podcast site, all your platforms are right there unless you prefer iTunes or something like that. But uh, you just look it up. Uh, I'm King of the Mountain radio or KOTM radio on YouTube. That's my, my channel. And that's where I'm focusing a little bit more right now. I used to focus on Podbean. Now I'm focusing more on YouTube, but we cover impact every day in a positive manner, a positive and honest manner. 
I have Ali coming on the show soon. I have Sienna coming on the show. I have William Weeks. He was the enhancement talent that's been on a couple times, a real skinny, funny looking dude. I have the future legend CEO coming on soon. So those are my next four guests. And I'm not forecasting out too much further, but the Alley show and the Sienna show should be really big, uh, really big deals. And uh, definitely, definitely check me out. Definitely. Make sure you guys check out BQ. His podcast is great. King of the Mountain podcast. I love it. Like I, it's my favorite impact podcast to say the least. It's one of my favorite podcasts to listen to every week. I enjoy it for the fact of the matter that it, if I don't get to catch impact, I can listen to the podcast and get everything I need from it. And that's a cool aspect. I feel completely satisfied after listening to it. And that says a lot. Appreciate that. Man. Thank you for coming on BQ. We definitely going to have you on again, man. Appreciate yeah. Thank you for that, having man. me. Thank you. And nope. I look forward to it. Definitely. No problem, man. As always, guys, thank you guys for listening to the podcast. Follow me on Twitter at Delvin underscore Cox. Follow BQ. What's your, what's your Twitter handle, BQ? BQ underscore K-O-T-M. Definitely. Make sure you guys check them out. As always, man, Delvin Cox Spirits, we out. Peace. All right, before y'all go, I got a little Easter egg, a little surprise for y'all. Remember when we were talking about an episode earlier about BQ's music career? Well, I figured, let me go out there and find one of his songs. So I went on iTunes and got one of his songs. Now, for your listening pleasure, I have BQ, the MC, featuring Hopskin, and his single called Popular. Check it out. It's going to play right now. If you want to download it, you want to buy it, it's on iTunes. So please support your brother and please support King of the Mountain Podcast. It's a great podcast. You guys should all check it out. Thank you, guys. Peace. Anyone who's heard me to stay your name says my music ain't popular, ain't popular. When I create, maybe not for all. They couldn't see me with binoculars, with binoculars. They say I ain't popular. They say I ain't popular, ain't popular. They say I ain't popular. Yo, yeah, they say yeah, I ain't popular, yo. ain't popular. Look at me for the legendary artist that raised me. Forgive me, hitting often as the lyrics amaze me. They said it shouldn't happen. This modern music's a mess. Feel like you and hop. Too wet hot, the music is fresh Keep a watch in my backpack Ahead of my time I could finger paint my lyrics and be Better than flies Lyrical manslaughter Nasty as lemonade made with bath water Banging any man's daughter Never decline Turned to a grown man Had a nope. couple drinks like Lindsay Lohan nope. Still never losing my way Never did coke, man yeah. But throw these lines down Haters throw up both hands Then they recycle their rhymes like they was cold cans yeah. They said I flop if I ain't sounded like Little John no. It's confirmation that possibly now the skill is gone yeah. Pencil to the pad, write the realest song Got a bad feeling, I'm afraid that the feeling's strong Anyone who's heard me to stay your name Says my music ain't popular, ain't popular When I create, maybe not for all They couldn't see me with binoculars, with binoculars They say I ain't popular, they say I ain't popular Ain't popular They say I ain't popular, they say I ain't popular Ain't popular Y'all yeah. got it twisted, I'ma yank your car You rolling around in Lamborghinis, I'm Struggling with a basic car I got dreams of trying to make it large In order for me to do that I might have to suit up and raise the bar My style's rated R I ain't the scar When I step up on the scene You niggas better vacate the yard Thank the Lord that I ain't using weapons I could have had you tied up at gunpoint Asking you stupid questions This is a ton of shit that you just stepped in You niggas is pussy So when I battle you I get a huge erection You know that it's the W is repping I like spitting funk up on the microphone Fuck a fruity breath man I'm the new contestant up in this it's music biz Every second I'ma always wreck it and do it big Watch what all the subliminal messages do to kids And in the meantime I'm trying to figure out who to diss Come Anyone on Anyone who's heard me to stay your name Says my music ain't popular Ain't popular When I create maybe not for all They couldn't see me with binoculars With binoculars they say I ain't popular They say I ain't popular Ain't popular They say I ain't popular yo, yo, They say I it. ain't popular yo. Ain't popular Coming off bitter rappers I wanna see them like John Ritter I'll have them resting in peace Lyrical bomb spitter Not the biggest dog But bring it from the top litter Still they wanna dance These people look at me like chopped liver Military 
Ferrari had me cruising in Humvees I'm humble while your ego's almost big as my Busby Your rhyme's weaker than a love squeeze I mean I gotta love her paper I'm not a hippie but I hug trees I'm from the era where they rock change and say they better But now they run and tuck it in like they Caitlyn Jenner The cues arrived and what I say is clever See just like a 12 year old with Minecraft I can play this game forever And check my verbals like Venom Purpose to get them feeling the realest of music Every verse is like heaven High school crush couldn't talk to her Cause I played trumpet in the band and wasn't popular Anyone who's heard me this day and age Says my music ain't popular Ain't popular When I create, maybe not for all They couldn't see me with binoculars With binoculars They say I ain't popular They say I ain't popular Ain't popular They say I ain't popular They say I ain't popular Ain't popular